going to move from discussion of aortic aneurysms here to above the neck. And we're going to discuss aneurysms in the brain. And I was talking with our speaker, trying to get an idea of the, the size. Look at your thumb. That's about how big your aorta is, the main blood vessel here. And I was trying to find out how big are these blood vessels that we're now going to learn about. And I was told the biggest ones are about the size of a thread. And some of the little ones that he works with, the size of a single hair. I'm impressed. Um, so let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Shekhar is a, the Leadham Biglow and Leadham Professor. He is the Vice Chairman of Neurological Surgery here at the University of Washington. He is Director of the Cerebrovascular Surgery Group, and he's Co-Director of the Skull Base Surgery Group. <coughs> he definitely does state-of-the-art work, which he's going to describe, and he's helped to bring the field of neurosurgery into new territory. He has a patent for an aneurysm detecting device. He has pioneered quite a few new techniques. And he's really helped to create the field of cranial base surgery for tumors. And I'm hoping that he'll describe some of the new operations that he has developed. Obviously, he specializes in the treatment of very complex neurosurgical disorders. He works at Harborview Medical Center. And he is currently the president of the World Federation Skull Base Societies. As I said, he created the field. And he obtained his medical degree in India. He then went on to a very lengthy neurosurgical training. Uh, he started off at, at Cook County Hospital in Chicago, followed by the University of Cincinnati, and then the, the University of Pittsburgh. He's a prolific scientist, more than 200 peer-reviewed publications, 100 book chapters, and four books. And prior to coming to Seattle in 2005, he held many prestigious positions, including professor and vice chairman in New York. He was professor and chairman of a department at George Washington University. And also, he started out his academic career in um, neurosurgical surgery at the University of Pittsburgh. <laughs> I like that. Aww. <laughs> he has another life which is wonderful. Um, when he goes home, uh, he's got three children. Uh, the oldest is out of the home, I believe. But this is Chris, who's three, and Daniela, who's five. And I think when he gets home, he doesn't have much time to think about neurosurgical techniques. And I always ask our speakers to send me a photo. And this is what I received. This is him playing <laughs> cricket. So he's an amazingly talented individual. Just think of the size of a hair when you, you're seeing some of the video clips that he's going to show. And um, we're very lucky to have you. It, we've got a world-renowned center here at Harborview. Thank you very much, Dr. Shepard. Appreciate it. Good evening. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, again, thanks for the opportunity. So uh, we're going to shift the focus here and talk about brain aneurysms, which are a completely different problem from the abdominal aneurysms. You talk about size. It is important in the brain as well. But the, our relative idea of size is such that when they get to about an inch, we call them giant aneurysms. So most of the brain aneurysms we are talking about that we treat are in the range of about uh, between 4 and 7 millimeters which is about a fifth of an inch. So first of all, uh, we, I'm going to frame it in two different uh, perspectives. The first is to tell you about stroke and the different kinds of stroke and where brain aneur ruptured brain aneurysms fit into this uh, paradigm. And then I'm going to talk about the problem of aneurysms as a whole. And then I'll talk to you about the different kinds of treatment. So third leading cause of death in the United States after heart disease and cancer is stroke. Now, if you look at stroke, 80% is occlusive stroke. So this is the most common type of stroke that your grandfather or grandmother may have suffered, and many of us still do suffer when we, when we are uh, elderly or even young. doesn't matter. It spares no one. 
and about 20% uh, are hemorrhagic, that is, they are due to hemorrhage. And about 15% in all are hemorrhages inside the brain. Another 5% are hemorrhages around the brain. That is called subarachnoid hemorrhage. And that's the most common uh, cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is ruptured brain aneurysm. So how do brain hemorrhages manifest? It is different according to whether you have an intracerebral hemorrhage or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Intracerebral hemorrhage happens inside the brain, so there is a buffer zone. So patients start usually complaining a headache, and they will have a progression of deficit. And very frequently, of course, when we see them in the hospital, they may have a paralysis of the arm or leg, or they may even be comatose. On the other hand, subarachnoid hemorrhage occurs at the base of the brain where there's very little support for these blood vessels. So the rupture of the aneurysm is catastrophic. So the patient may have coma at onset or severe headache, fainting, et cetera. And very frequently, if you ask the patient if they are conscious, they'll tell you that they've had the worst headache of their life. So what are the common, most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is a ruptured aneurysm. However, in about 20% of the patients, we find no cause, and we, we still don't know what causes these uh, patients to have a hemorrhage. We work them up. We have to do at least two angiograms separated by a week to prove that they do not have a ruptured aneurysm. If that be the case, then they generally do have a benign, very benign course and a very good prognosis. However, 80% of the patients do have a ruptured aneurysm. Now, about 20% of patients with ruptured aneurysms have what's called a sentinel bleed. Sentinel bleed is a, could be either a very tiny rupture or it can be simply a little expansion of the wall, and the patients are uh, considered to have a, a very severe and acute headache, but they may have a variety of minor symptoms such as a headache with a little neck stiffness, uh, nausea, vomiting. A lot of these symptoms can be missed, and they are often missed in our emergency rooms anywhere in the country in about 20% of the cases. The problem is when the sentinel hemorrhage is picked up, the prognosis is much better, and when they are missed, the prognosis is worse because they come back then with a much worse bleeding. Uh, and Within 30 days, in a population-based study in 1994, there is a 45% mortality, and of the survivors, about a half are disabled. So this is a disease. When you have the subarachnoid hemorrhage, it is very serious implications. Nevertheless, we have made a lot of strides in those folks that do survive, and I'm going to tell you about that. Now, what's the incidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage? The population of the U.S. at the moment is about 300 million. So there are annually about 30,000 patients that get this type of subarachnoid hemorrhage per year. And there are countries like Finland and Japan, for unknown reasons, that have a higher incidence of this uh, hemorrhage. And you will see today, I'm going to introduce to you later on, two of my former uh, and still patients. Uh, who, are, who have been successfully treated, and they're both women. So note that this is a disease that affects more women than men. It doesn't mean that men are not affected, but more women are affected than men. Uh, smoking increases the risk by three, threefold. Now, uh, I was introduced as the Leadum uh, and Bigelow Leadum uh, professor. By the way, the Leadums are very prominent lawyers uh, that represent the university on a variety of matters, their claim to fame is that they successfully sued the tobacco companies and got a, won a huge settlement for the state of Washington. And one of their partners died of uh, smoking-related illness. So I'm actually holding the, a chair that they have donated, which has some direct impact from smoking, cigarette smoking, as does the aortic aneurysms. Now, how do we grade the patient? This is very important for us to do. Uh, we have to have a grading system when, the, when we see these folks. And of course, it's, it, it's simply something like a patient being alert and talking to you and just complaining of a headache uh, has, is grade one or is considered to be in a very good grade. 
whereas a patient who's in a, a coma is a, a grade five or a poor grade. And this has a very big impact on how the patients do. So this is very important for us when we see these folks. We also have another gradation system that's called the Fisher grading system. And this, this tells us how much bleeding or how much blood there is inside the blood. And this has an impact on a condition called vasospasm, which I'm going to tell you what it is about. And the more blood you have inside the head, the more likelihood of subsequent problems, both vasospasm and hydrocephalus, et cetera. Now here are uh, three different patients. Uh, this is a typical subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see that this is blood. These are all, this is an axial section. That is an axial slice of the brain. Here's another patient with a blood inside the, mostly inside the brain. This is an intracerebral clot. But this patient on CT angiogram, actually we give the dye intravenously and we can take very thin slices with CT scan. You can also see the aneurysm that caused this uh, rupture. The third here is a patient who has blood inside the ventricle. This is the fluid containing space inside the brain. So the bleeding actually started here in what's called the posterior fossa. Posterior fossa is located in the back of your head. It's a very small age area which contains very critical structures. And the bleeding started here and spread up into the other ventricles. The reason for this is that the patient has an aneurysm here. But why does the aneurysm happen here? This blood vessel is actually supplying what's called a vascular malformation, abnormal tangle of blood vessels. Due to this increased blood flow, the patient has developed an aneurysm which then ruptured. So it's, it's, you can have multiple causes for these things. Now, we're going to look at it from a different perspective, brain aneurysm. So I've estimated uh, the audience in this room to be about uh, 400, perhaps. And uh, of course, the majority are about the age of 30. Uh, I'm just looking around the room. Uh, so it is about 1 to 2 percent of the population. So I would say that perhaps between 4 to 8 of, of you today have an unruptured aneurysm. I know that two patients, two of you don't have it because I have just recently looked inside their head angiographically, uh, but the rest I'm not so sure about. The incident, these are developmental lesions. They are not, they are not born with them, and they, the incidence does increase with age. And there are certain conditions. The, the one condition is called a familial aneurysm syndrome. That means that at least you have two family members uh, that are afflicted with aneurysms your incidence goes up about four, four times, fourfold. But there are also other conditions like Marfan syndrome, uh, autosomal polycystic kidney disease, et cetera, which increase the incidence of aneurysms. There is no definite link with hypertension. And most of these unruptured aneurysms are generally asymptomatic until rupture happens. And we talked about uh, sentinel bleed, uh, and this is again uh, a, uh, a warning leak. It's called a warning leak. Uh, unfortunately, the symptoms may often be very mild so that they can even be missed by very good physicians. Not, not because people miss them not because they uh, weren't looking for them, but just that the symptoms are so generic. So this is what an aneurysm look like. They typically occur at the bifurcations of blood vessels. So Right at this bifurcation point, this is a blood vessel here, and that's a branch vessel. And right here, there's a lot of stress. And this stress throughout your life, stress doesn't mean, we're, we're not talking about stress like, uh, you know, your husband or wife causing you stress, but really the hemodynamic stress of the blood just pounding away and that, in that bifurcation point, it leads to the development of the aneurysm. So there are parts of the aneurysm. This is called the fundus or the dome. And this is called the sac. And this is called the neck of the aneurysm. So this is like a grape. And this area is called, and we see this in many patients with rupture, called a Murphy stit. This is an area where the rupture happened. Now look at this aneurysm on the other hand. It's a bigger one. Nevertheless, the neck is wider. Why is this important? This is very important during endovascular treatment or microsurgical treatment. 
Aneurysms which have a narrow neck like this uh, can easily be treated by endovascular coiling. Aneurysms with a wide neck can't be because when we put the coils, they come out. So you, we're going to talk about this later. Now these are some common locations where aneurysms occur. This is the brain and part of it has been sliced away. This is your frontal lobe, temporal lobe. So we're looking at everything upside down. So as neurosurgeons, we are used to looking at the brain from different perspectives. We can look at it upside down. Sometimes we look at it inside out by endovascular technique, or we may look at it from the left side, the right side. Believe me, no matter what your race or ethnic origin, what country you're from, once we open the head, the brain looks the same to us. So we, we, are, we believe in one world, <laughs> one people. So this is the most common location of a ruptured aneurysm. This is called the ACOM area, anterior communicating. There is a, this whole region of vessels is called the circle of willis. And this is a kind of a, a, an area where the two carotid arteries are connecting with what's called the basilar artery. And these two carotid arteries are connecting with each other in the midline. So this is called the ACOM area. This is called the posterior communicating region. And this is the basilar tip. So these three type uh, aneurysms. And then this is called the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So these are different locations where we commonly see aneurysms. And I did mention earlier that we grade aneurysms as small, large, and giant. Small for us is less than one centimeter. Giant is more than an inch. So giant is not very, and, and we only see about 3% of giant aneurysms. So most of them do rupture before they get to that size. Now, when or why do aneurysms rupture? And this is a, a, a very, very important question, and we don't really know. And we do know that it is related to size of aneurysm. We know that it's located to lo, uh, related to location. Smoking has a real influence on it. And extreme hypertension, either by uh, in an unmedicated patient or something uh, patients, and we, we do see some of these folks at Harborview, uh, folks that have taken recreational drugs and come in with uh, blood pressure in the range of 200 and ruptured aneurysms as well. Uh, so these are all factors, but in general, we, we still don't understand everything about when and why they rupture. So what do you do when, what is, uh, you are all going to be now practicing physicians as of tomorrow, and you will be in mock emergency rooms, or at least you'll be advising your colleagues, okay, they're going to look to you. So what do you do when a patient presents to you with the worst headache of their life? This is the typical history for rupture aneurysm. So the thing that you have to do is to get a CT scan of the head. CT scan is the most sensitive test for blood. Then you do a CT scan and it's negative. Then what do you do? Some patients, some physicians used to send the patients home. This is exactly what you shouldn't do. The patient needs to undergo a lumbar puncture by an experienced physician because sometimes if the blood is not very uh, a lot, then CT scan can be negative. And then we initiate a series of steps. If, if you make a positive diagnosis, then you go on to do uh, further treatment measures. Of course, you have to look at the ABCs of the patient. Is the patient, uh, does the patient have a good airway? Are they breathing, et cetera, et cetera? Then we initiate. Uh, and of course, if it is possible, and if you have one in your area, you're lucky, transfer to an aneurysm treatment uh, center. Now, I mentioned different types of tests. Some of these, we use them as screening tests, and some of them, we do them for a quick diagnosis in the emergency room. One of them is called a CT angiogram. So basically, uh, dye is given in the vein, and very rapid uh, slices are taken uh, through the head. And that gives us a reconstructed image like, that looks like this. This is an ACOM area aneurysm. This is basilar tip. This is a giant carotid aneurysm. Now, you can also do the, uh, a similar test using MR technology without any dye. It's not as good, in my uh, view, as a good CT angiogram. Nevertheless, it can show here is a carotid angiogram, and this is a vertebral angiogram. You can see an aneurysm only as a small blip. The reason is part of this is uh, clotted, so you don't see the entire aneurysm. But now, nevertheless, the real test that we depend on, once we have made a diagnosis, 
is called an intra-arterial digital subtraction angiogram. A, a very tiny puncture, we introduced very small catheters, much, much smaller than what he had talked about earlier. And then these catheters are taken up to the brain blood vessels and we inject a dye. And that's a diagnostic angiogram. So almost all diagnostic procedures, with the exception of children, are done under local anesthesia. Most of the time, the patients don't complain about it too much. Sometimes they don't like it. But we try to keep them. They can be given some intravenous sedation, et cetera. Of course, it also depends on who's doing the procedure. Uh, these are different types of uh, aneurysm. This is a middle cerebral artery aneurysm. This is a basilar tip carotid aneurysm. Now, look at these images. Look how they, lo they look so nice, don't they? They look uh, they're like they're in three dimensions. This is a technology that's been available to us only in the last five or six years. This is called three-dimensional reconstruction, and I'm going to show you that, how we do it in a minute. So we talked about how do we manage the patient initially when we get the patient. So the first thing, of course, is that we evaluate their ABCs. And if they are not breathing, or if they are uh, in a coma, or if they are stuporous, very frequently, they'll have a tube placed. The next thing we do, of course, we oxygenate them. We uh, check their heart, et cetera. The next thing we do is we control their blood pressure. We don't want a blood pressure to go too high, because the aneurysms very frequently re-rupture or re-bleed. And when they rupture a second time, it's always much worse. The hemorrhage is even worse. And then they go on to have a neurological evaluation. And uh, frequently in our place, they get a CT angiogram because this helps us to plan the treatment. And uh, if they have a lot of fluid in the ventricles of the brain, we'll place a, a small tube called a ventriculostomy that diminishes the pressure inside the head. We can't drop it too much because the pressure inside the head has actually stopped the bleeding of the aneurysm. So if you drop it too much, then it can also induce re-bleeding of the aneurysm. And then we decide how we're going to treat this patient. So basically, two treatments, either endovascular or surgical. And we'll come to that in a minute. So uh, what happens after this endovascular or microsurgical treatment? Usually this is done within 24 hours. The patient remains in the intensive care for anywhere from 10 to 21 days. Why is that? The reason is the bleeding that they've already suffered causes a lot of problems. And we have to manage those and pull the patient out of all the problems that they've had and prevent some other problems that I'm going to show to you. And the patients afterwards, they go to the regular ward and they discharge to home or they're inpatient rehab or if they didn't, didn't do so well, skill nursing. And guess what? Lo and behold, three months later when we see them, something magical happens. A lot of patients get much, much better. So we've got to get them through that first 24 days, and this is very crucial. So what sort of problems do these patients have? The first and the most important problem is that the brain is damaged by the bleeding. The second thing is the blood that is at the base of the brain causes a condition called vasospasm, that is severe constriction of the blood vessels. And this can be managed by simply raising the blood pressure or doing what's called angioplasty, that is we go back by the groin and then dilate the vessels. Uh, the patient, of course, ha has to be in the ICU for a long time, especially uh, to prevent these problems or to manage them. They need support of oxygenation, nutrition, uh, et cetera. They can also get excessive fluid inside the brain. The reason is the fluid is not being properly absorbed due to the blood clot. That's called hydrocephalus. So the whole thing is not just done by the neurosurgeon. It's a, it's a big team effort. The team consists of neurosurgeon, anesthesiologist, emergency room uh, doctors, internists, intensive care doctors, nursing, rehab specialists. So it's very important to have this entire team. Without this team, we can't do all the stuff that we do. Now, this is an example of vasospasm. Here, look, these vessels are very severely narrowed. This is a carotid artery. And here is a balloon catheter we've taken up to dilate this vessel. We can also sometimes give chemicals like nicotapine 
And then here after the dilatation, you see what the vessels look like. This is called intracranial angioplasty. Now I'm going to talk to you about endovascular treatment of aneurysms. Now, no doubt, if we can treat something without cracking the patient's skull, that would be the easier way. And this is a relatively new treatment for aneurysms because now we have to deal with not regular standard catheters, but microcatheters. Microcatheters, I'm going to show you some, are, are very, very tiny, about the size of your hair. So this is our modern endovascular suite at Harborview Hospital. And look at these two areas. That's called a biplane unit. We can shoot x-rays in two different directions at the same time. Just to let you know, this suite, each one of these suites costs the hospital $5 million. And this is uh, me and along with Dr. Hallam doing an endovascular procedure. And this is a machine that can rotate do, when we are taking x-rays. And by its rotation, it can give us three-dimensional views. Look at how the, this is not an aneurysm, this is a brain AB malformation. Nevertheless, we can look at this in multiple directions. We can measure it. We can plan stenting. We can plan coiling. We can decide, is it fit for surgery or uh, coiling, et cetera. And here is, this is endovascular axis. So the catheter is going through a groin right about here, through the femoral artery. This is called the axis catheter. So this is about six French. This is a microcatheter through which the, uh, the coils are going to be taken up and deployed. And it's about one to one and a half French. It's pretty small size. So this is a, 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 a schema of endovascular treatment. These are the coils that we are going to deploy. And watch this cartoon. This is a microcatheter inside the aneurysm. And then these are platinum coated coils. And when we deploy them and when we are happy, then we can detach them. What these coils do, they simply induce clotting. So uh, we, can, we, we just progressively fill it up like you have a bowl and you just start dropping stones inside. Eventually, the bowl becomes full. You can't hold much water. And that's the same thing happens. Thrombus forms inside. But of course, the coils have to stay inside the aneurysm and not go outside. And this is the route by which the catheter will go to get to the brain. So this is an example of a basilar tip aneurysm. This is one of uh, the very difficult areas. Basilar tip is, if you, if you were to draw two lines over here and here that where it meets inside at the base of the brain, and there are tiny vessels here. You're going to see that in the, when I show you the surgery that supply very critical parts of the brain. And this is a basilar tip aneurysm coiled. You can see that the aneurysm is not 100% coiled. There's a little bit left here. And that is something that can cause us trouble down the road. This is a 78-year-old woman. She was just found down. And she was uh, found down in an apartment. And she was found by one of her relatives and then brought to the hospital. And she was discovered to have subarachnoid hemorrhage. And here's a CT angiogram showing the aneurysm. And this is a 3D rotational angio showing that this is the aneurysm of the carotid artery with a nice neck. So we uh, started coiling. Here's a microcatheter. This is the guiding catheter or the catheter through which it goes. Microcatheter is all the way up inside the aneurysm. This is the first coil. This is called a framing coil. It acts as a frame to hold the other coils inside. And you can see that we can shoot angiograms in two planes, usually during the coiling. Uh, this is one plane, this is the other plane. So we're watching to make sure that the coils are in the right spot. And we keep putting coils, and this is post-coil 13. We're now happy that the aneurysm is well treated. And uh, earlier on, the question was asked, how much do these cost? Each coil costs about $1,000. And uh, there are uh, at least four companies making them. The most, the busiest company is Boston Scientific, which is a division of J&J. &J, and that's based in, uh, but the coils are made in California. They're platinum coated coils. Now, there are patients in whom the neck is broad, so we can't keep the coils inside. So in these cases, what do you do? Uh, one common technique that we use is to deploy a stent. And that's a type of stent here, very tiny stent. This is a stent that's been deployed to hold the coils in. One of the problems that we have is that it's very difficult 
to do this in a patient who's had a rupture. Why? Because these folks need to be on antiplatelet agents, aspirin and Plavix, for at least three months. So that means that we can't do anything else with that patient at that time. We can't change a ventriculostomy. We can't put a shunt in them. Uh, there's a greater risk of them bleeding. So <clears throat> stents are generally not done in patients with ruptured aneurysms, but rather folks with unruptured aneurysms. This is a, a called a neuroform stent, uh, and it just holds a coil in. This is another stent called enterprise stent. So this uh, is a uh, rather difficult case. 70-year-old woman with a ruptured, very large aneurysm of the mid-basilar artery, absolutely no neck. And look at how this vessel is irregular. All of this means it doesn't look much different from the aortic aneurysm that uh, Dr. Stahn showed, only size is different. So if you imagine this magnified or uh, microfied, it is, this is that. And uh, she's also in poor grade. So she was not a good candidate for surgical treatment, open surgical treatment. We decided, here are the two vertebral arteries. Here's a microcatheter up in one of the distal vessels, and we are first going to deploy a stent here. And then a microcatheter through the other side, other vessel coming in to place coils inside the aneurysm. So here, first the stent is placed. You can recognize it by these tines, which are the two ends of the stent. And that stent is then holding the first coil. And this, look at the size of this coil. And then <clears throat> after this, we put in 34 coils. So that is $34,000 right there for Boston Scientific, of course, <laughs> not for me. <laughs> this patient recovered very well from the procedure, but unfortunately, she developed a variety of problems because she was a vasculopath, she had a lot of small vessel disease, she didn't do well uh, from all the other complications, she did not make, out of the make it out of the hospital. I want to show you that some of these folks can be like this. This is a 51-year-old uh, woman with a grade 3 subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here is a large aneurysm arising from the carotid artery. The problem is there is a vessel arising from the neck of the aneurysm. We decided to treat this patient endovascularly. So we started coiling this aneurysm, but after the 11th coil was put in, the angiogram shows suddenly that this vessel is occluded. This is one of the advantages of endovascular technique. We can follow the progress of coiling. Of course, you've got to be able to do something. Here we were lucky. We were actually able to get a microcatheter in this vessel and deploy a stent emergently and we use uh, an antiplatelet agent, intravenous antiplatelet agent, to keep her uh, fluid. This is not an ideal situation. Nevertheless, we were able to preserve this vessel and yet coil. She did very well. She spent about a month in the hospital, did well, went home. However, this shows one of the problems of coiling. The coiling is not always permanent. The patients need follow-up angiography. We usually do it at six months, then at two years, uh, nowadays, we can also follow the patients using MR technique, MR angiography. And if they do have recurrence, frequently we can treat them again by endovascular method, but uh, not necessarily requiring surgery. Sometimes they need surgery. Here is uh, recurrence of the aneurysm, and we had to go back and uh, recoil. So what are the pros and cons of this technique? Obviously, no craniotomy, no brain injury, shorter procedure time, an immediate angiographic control. On the downside, we, we have a lot of trouble treating broad neck and giant aneurysms, and there is a recurrence down the road that they may need to be watched. So when you have coils inside your aneurysm, sometimes you're not 100% sure that the condition is not coming back. <clears throat> now we're moving on, move on to microsurgical clipping. This is an older technique, of course, which is being refined and is being continuously refined. And uh, we can do now things much, much better than uh, the way they were do done in the 60s or 70s. Every decade, there is, uh, there is further improvement. The clips that we use nowadays are made of titanium. This is where, how the operating room looks. This is the operating microscope. We're looking through this. It is magnifying the, the field about 16 times. So we are working 
under very, very high magnification. Here's a surgeon and the assistant and the scrub nurse. You have an anesthesiologist. You have people monitoring brain function over there. And uh, so you have a lot of people. And these are very fine instruments that we have to use, very fine scissors. These are clips, uh, et cetera. And you could see the, some of these instruments. And these are some clips that, that we use to pinch the, uh, the aneurysm. These are clips that are, by the way, that are, there used to be clip manufacturing in the US, but it's closed down. There are two big clip companies. One is Esculap in Germany. And I've been in their factory. They are handmade. They are examined. Every clip is un examined under the microscope. Every clip has a number. So they know who made, who was responsible for that particular clip. The other set of clips are made in, in uh, Japan by Sugida Company. So during an operation, uh, this is, of course, the patient has requested the whole head is be shaved. But we could do it with minimal hair shave. The patient is fixed in, in, the, uh, in some very firm device. Uh, fortunately, the patients don't see it until later, because they'll be afraid of this. Uh, we make these holes, uh, and we actually cut the bone using very sophisticated but expensive tools. They don't look a whole lot different from the tools you, look, you hold for use in your uh, garage. And then this is how they're put back. And we can put it back in a way that nobody can tell that the patient had ever had an operation. And I'm going to show you what these look like under the microscope. This is a patient with a basilar tip aneurysm. And this is a younger patient and had a very broad neck, so we elected to do surgery. And what you're going to see is we will be looking at everything upside down. We're going to put in what's called a temporary clip. And then we will clip the aneurysm itself. So here's the video. That's the basilar artery. The aneurysm is actually over here. We are going to put a temporary clip to stop the flow to reduce the pressure. Because if we are dissecting the aneurysm, we don't want it to pop. <clears throat> that, can be, that can stop your heart for a few, for a few seconds. Uh, I'm used to it, by the way. Uh, <laughs> this is the aneurysm here, which has been previously ruptured. And we have uh, negotiated a clip around the neck. And we're going to close it down very, very slowly. I always tell our residents. We close it with our heartbeat. So each heartbeat, we close it a little bit. And then we take off the temporary clip. And then we are going to use endoscopes to look around the clip. This is an endoscope. Why? There are very tiny vessels, hair-like vessels, which we're going to look for. Make sure that we haven't closed those. That's one, one of them. See that? Those vessels, are, they make the difference between an awake patient and a comatose patient. This is the post-op aneurysm. This patient did very well uh, without. One of the advantages of clipping is that they very rare to get a recurrent. Now, this is a very complicated aneurysm, giant one, and two vessels coming right out of the aneurysm neck. This is also a patient with atrial fibrillation on Coumadin. So we had to stop that to do the operation. So what did we do here? We can't just go and clip the aneurysm because we had to save the vessels. So what we did was we did a radial artery graft into one of the vessels. And then we made a side-to-side -side connection between one vessel and another vessel. And then we could completely exclude the aneurysm. That's what this cartoon depicts. And this is a post-operative angiogram. Shows the radial artery graft going into one vessel. And here's the side-to-side -side connection that you can see. And this patient did pretty well. She did have some transient confusion. Uh, et cetera, but recovered completely. This is another young boy, 10 years old. He has this complicated aneurysm of the vertebral basilar arteries. He's been coiled two or three times before, didn't work. So what do we do with this? And he has very severe daily headaches and hypertension. The mom is afraid this is going to pop at any moment. So what we did here was we did a vein graft from one of the arteries to another artery here. That's a vein graft. And we clipped the entrance into the aneurysm. However, the space was so tiny that we thought that it was completely closed. There wasn't. There's still some blood getting through. So the patient was brought back, and we, we placed a microcatheter in through that tiny opening, and we just coiled the aneurysm shut. So we just closed it off. But now, since he has his bypass procedure, 
you know, he's just, just fine. Things are working very well. This is an even more complicated case, 62-year-old woman with a diagnosis of giant basilar tip aneurysm that was coiled in 2002. Every year, she goes and gets more and more coils put in. And, and she gets, keeps getting worse because the coils now are acting as a mass lesion. And she also has big cysts inside the brain. You can look at this. I think that's about $100,000 worth of coils right there. So what do we do? And so we do, we do some desperate measures, cause, call for desperate operations. So what we did here, we made a connection from the vertebral artery to one of the arteries here, and then we just shut off the flow going to the brain. So it's called basilar artery occlusion. And of course, she was temporarily worse for about a week, but lo and behold, she's actually from St. Louis, and when I was giving a lecture there, I went to visit her, visit with her and her family. She is do it, just doing fantastic. And you know, this is one of the greatest things that as a doctor that you get. Fortunately, 95% of our patients do well, 5% <clears throat> don't. The 95% give us some um, uh, en encouragement, enthusiasm to go forward. Now, which is better, clipping or coiling? So how, what do we do? We had a, there was an international randomized trial that was conducted of over 9,500 patients, only 22,000 could be randomized, and they were randomized to, uh, to clipping or coiling. And what was found was that folks that had coiling did better than clipping. There are some critiques of this trial. One of the critiques is that, of course, not all aneurysms can be coiled. The second critique is that in this particular trial, all the coiling was done by experts. The clipping was done by anyone. Like, not, I don't mean anyone, but <laughs> maybe some of you will be ready. <laughs> but senior residents in neurosurgery or young folks, people with not so much experience. So that was one of the major critiques of this trial. Nevertheless, what we do, what this trial has done, it has changed the landscape of aneurysm treatment in the US. Uh, aneurysms should only be treated in centers where you have both coiling and clipping available, and generally by surgeons who can do both or work together in teams. Uh, another thing is that uh, in our own institution, we have looked uh, at outcomes. Where what we have found is clipping and coiling have very, almost equal outcomes. Uh, in fact, in some areas, clipping comes out better over the long term. So how do we approach aneurysms when we see them now? Younger patients, broad neck, clipping. Older patients, narrow neck, coiling, but there is a wide spectrum in between. What's young and old, of course, is relative and depends on your age. You know that. Uh, unruptured aneurysms, of course, we are able to give them the patients often the choice. We can actually talk to the patients and tell them, look, you have a choice between this and that, etc. cetera. Uh, this gives you a flavor of aneurysm treatment. 400 ruptured aneurysms treated over about three years, unruptured about 200, almost even numbers for clipping and coiling. So we are one of the largest centers for treatment of aneurysms. What I wanted to show is look at the outcomes. These are ruptured aneurysms. Hunton has grade one and two. These are people who are in good condition when they come to us. Uh, MRS zero to two means the patient is at least able to manage his or her own affairs at three months. 85% recovery uh, at, at this three months. But look at grade five. These are folks that come in a coma, 35% recovery. These numbers are about one and a half times better. These are Harborview numbers, one and a half times better than the international trial. So our own data, our own numbers are much better because of very aggressive and multidisciplinary uh, treatment. Patients, of course, can have long-term problems after aneurysm treatment. Some, most of them don't, but some do. Headaches, hydrocephalus, functional or financial disabilities, life adjustment problems, etc. So a lot of research that's going on. <clears throat> the first thing is 
how can we improve the outcomes? How can we treat patients less invasively? The other thing is understanding why they happen and some of the genes. There are a lot of genes that have been worked out, but we still don't know a lot about the genetics. We're just starting to scratch the surface. Uh, a word about Harborview is the largest uh, and most comprehensive aneurysm treatment center in the Whammy region, one of the largest aneurysm treatment centers in, in the U.S. And we have certainly pioneered a lot of cutting, cutting edge uh, technologies and a lot of research going on. Very important to emphasize our multidisciplinary uh, treatment team. So we talk about miracles. Miracles, of course, can be miracles like walking on water, but most medical miracles happen in steps. And they, are, they happen because of teams of people working together, doctors, nurses, rehabilitation specialists, <clears throat> et cetera. So we can say today that our results are much better than ever, they were ever in the past, but we still have a huge number of patients where our, we need to improve our results. And a lot has to be done with public education and further research. I have with me today two patients, and uh, one of them is uh, Stephanie Haskins. If you can just come up for a second. Stephanie was a former uh, middle school uh, principal. She came in with a very bad ruptured aneurysm. She was in coma for two weeks in the intensive care. Even the nurses gave up on Stephanie. We just told them, well, look, we're just going to treat her there, and let's see what happens after three weeks. Miraculously, she started waking up. <laughs> she actually had surgery to clip the aneurysm, and now Stephanie is uh, back, and uh, she certainly can, can go back to her work, but her main mission in life, she will tell you what. Thank you. you want to tell us? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so proud to be here because I am with my hero. <laughs> um, I, I have a huge, large team of people that support me, four of them. Or three of them in the front row, my sister, my best friend, my other best friend, and all the other people want to hear how this went tonight. So I'm really glad to share you and say, um, when I was a principal, when I was a teacher, uh, and when I worked as a consultant with schools in Seattle to try and do all the right thing for kids and parents, you never thought of it happening to you. <laughs> I didn't think of this happening to me. I thought they would say to me, okay, let's, let's get going. So on February 7th, I had a meeting with them to talk about this really positive power that was going at Aki Karosi Middle School in South Seattle. We were really excited. And on Saturday, he saved my life. I didn't talk to him for, was it three weeks, four weeks? Before I could even... I was talking to you, but you weren't talking to oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think, I, I, I really, I believe that's why all my people, and I mean well over a hundred people that are friends that I know, teachers that I've worked with and so on, that came to see me, wanted to hear about what he was saying and what he was doing. And, um, and so I'm sort of passionate now after a year and a half to two years working on this every day. And I was challenged by people. I have to say this, I used to challenge them. Um, I used to be their principal. I used to be their supervisor. I used to hire them as teachers. I used to teach them as kids. And they all helped me. Now, I'd like to share that with anyone who goes through what you go through as you try to recover. Um, rehabilitate. But the most important thing that I think I want to have you understand is I have the rest of my life, which we think will be a long time because I'm working so hard every day, um, that the 5013C uh, levy, that, you know, company so that I can raise money to give it to Harborview so that we can get these things out to Harborview and to educate people. That's all I'm going to work on. Now, I have friends in, in schools that call me still and say, Stephanie, you sound really good. It's time to come back to school. But you know what? I'm really devoted to you and to anyone who has uh, gone through this, and I want to do what I can to make it one that you survive and that people that all of us know about it so you don't go through the one that I went through. We're, gonna, we're not going to do that anymore, okay? 
one last, one, just, one, just one last thing, okay? Joe Biden, Vice President of the United States of America, had a brain aneurysm. He doesn't talk about it. I'm going to write him a letter. <laughs> I'm going to see him because there are people like him and a, a wonderful singer that's got a lot of fans that follow him who's had. We need to all start talking about it because this is important work. And, and I think they'll want to hear me and talk to me because, after all, um, I have Dr. Shaker, the hero on this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One, one more patient. I'm going to ask uh, up uh, Lori Tian and her husband. Uh, Lori, interesting, a very interesting story. I want you to know. Lori uh, was 32 months uh, pregnant, and uh, she actually uh, is a, a very prominent uh, radio personality. <laughs> and uh, and uh, she had she was discovered to have a giant aneurysm in the back of her brain. So we ended up operating on her. And then uh, the baby came out by C-section, and she's got a health, healthy and beautiful baby. She had some problems with her voice, which have been fixed. And, and Lori is just getting back to relatively normal life. Yes, yes. And she uh, and her husband will say some words. Mm -hmm. And husband, of Thank course, very is very much. important. I just recently had a surgery on my throat, so I'm a little uh, scratchy. But I am profoundly grateful to Dr. Shager for saving my life. Let's please give him a round of applause. <laughs> I must say that through all this experience, I was in the hospital for about three months and it's been about a year now and I would have never ever in my life had the opportunity to realize how much people care if I had gone through this. And I am forever profoundly grateful because it's changed my life for the better, it really has. And I was left with very few slight de deficits after the amazing job that Dr. Shaker did. So I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> And I, I'll just say that it is really, as Dr. Shaker said, a, a, an amazing team, and, it, and it's, a, it's a total team effort. We had uh, the uh, uh, neonatal folks, the, the birthing people from the UW here that were monitoring Lori through, through two brain surgeries, um, and that her surgery was uh, just a year and three months ago. And uh, of course, when our baby was born prematurely, she was here at the uh, neonatal ICU for about four weeks before she came home, before mom did. And then uh, Lori's had follow-up care here at the UW as well, just had her had a, an implant put in her, her partially paralyzed vocal cord by uh, Dr. Marotti in the uh, otolaryngology clinic here at the UW. And so it's been, it's been an amazing experience, but uh, you know, we're, we're on the road to recovery. And once again, thanks very much to Dr. Shaker and everyone. We have time for a few questions. Uh, I think if you have a question, please go up to the microphone. Uh, if, if you don't, then I will try to repeat them for you, if you can. I had two questions. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, a procedure called a lumbar puncture, and I was wondering if you could talk about that a little more. And, um, and also, I was wondering uh, how you get the catheters up into the patient, how you, how you aim those things around? <laughs> <laughs> those are very good questions. Actually, the first one is lumbar puncture. We usually tell the patients we, we're going to give you local anesthetic and we're going to place a needle in the back. Uh, essentially, wh what we do is uh, the, we have the spine, and the spine is like a, a chain, and there are spaces through which we can actually get inside uh, with a needle. The most important thing is the patients have to have very good local anesthetic, and sometimes we give intravenous sedation. And uh, we use a needle which is uh, usually about this long, because, uh, and, and longer in some patients if they are uh, obese. And once we get into the right spot, we open the stylet. Stylet is a, uh, uh, the, the, some inner sheath. And we take that out, and the fluid comes out. So that's the lumbar puncture. This is done not only for uh, suspicion of hemorrhage, but also suspicion of infection even in children, meningitis, et cetera, lumbar puncture is done. 
Now, in regards to how we get the catheters up there, this is pretty tricky, actually. We have, uh, first of all, we can monitor everything we're doing uh, on the X-ray screen. So we, we make what's called a road map. So we do an angiogram, and that angiogram is up there on the screen. And then the catheter goes through, and in the, inside the catheter we have a micro wire. We have a very, very thin wire, which we can shape a little bit. And then we use you generally only two motions, forward and back, and twisting right and left. So it's a combination of these two motions. We can negotiate these catheters into a lot of uh, tight areas. The, of course, if the catheter or the wire goes through the aneurysm, then the aneurysm ruptures and the patient could die. So we, we got to get the catheter just in the right spot. Uh, or some of these catheters can also cause clots to form. So generally, uh, even in patients with ruptured aneurysms, once we have the first coil, we'll give anticoagulation with heparin. In non-ruptured aneurysms, we'll do it right at the start. Thank you very much. Thank you.